Good afternoon, everyone. A lot of committee meetings going on, and we wanted to have an opportunity. We're going to have people, I think, trickle in and out based on what they told me on the floor. But I didn't want to lose valuable time because I know many of you have made a long journey for our friends from the Ag Expo. Thank you for being here. And so we want to get you out of here as soon as possible. And um, I know what you've submitted to the governor, and I appreciate the spirit of cooperation which you've done that with. Uh, first, we will hear from uh, Deputy Director Sean Casey of the governor's office. just a little over one month, so if you are going to ask questions, I would ask you to take it easy on me. Uh, and also, oh good, uh, and also at any time, if, well, while I'm speaking, if you have questions, just interrupt me. Uh, if I'm not sure of something, I will t turn to Terry Landers here, who's the Division Director of Administration. Now, if you'd like, I can give you a brief overview of the Governor's Office and Governor's Emergency Fund, or if you'd like, I can just dive right into OB OBP's plans for fiscal year 2012. Okay. First, evaluations of services needed for core operations for OPB was implemented and has resulted in slimmer agency. Uh, OPB has seen a reduction in field positions from 71 and 71 positions in fiscal year 2009 to 45 as of July 1, 2010. Uh, several changes have taken place to assist in meeting the budget reduction necessary, obviously due to the downturn, uh, revenue downturn in the state. Uh, two positions were eliminated when the office went on HR shared services with SPA, and eight positions were transferred to SAO for the accounting shared services and payroll shared services. Uh, performance evaluation and development was streamlined, and four positions were eliminated. Uh, I should also add we uh, just started the process of uh, looking for a strategic planner. Uh, we've now moved forward, and three administrative secretary uh, positions were eliminated. The savings for fiscal year 2012 is $168,000. Uh, construction planning has been reduced from two positions to one. Uh, we also saw four months worth of savings for delaying hiring, which included actually delaying my hire for the deputy director position. Uh, savings were generated by giving up approximately 8,000 square feet back to GBA. That dollar figure equals $21,000 for fiscal year 2012. Uh, also, we had a reduction in the number of phone lines and voicemails from these terminations, which has generated uh, savings in the GTA billings of just um, a little under uh, $6,300. Uh, approximately half of the BlackBerry cell phones have been turned in, generating savings for fiscal year 12, which is roughly about $6,000. Uh, agency parking spaces have been evaluated, and a number of vacancies or vacant spaces have been turned back in generating savings of also about $6,000. Uh, we also took a look at subscriptions. Uh, subscriptions have been evaluated, and some of these have been eliminated, generating some savings. And, uh, and finally, uh, information technology systems have been evaluated and streamlined, allowing the elimination of one contract worker, which resulted in the savings of $80,000 for fiscal year 2012. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions that anyone has. Where, which is a real possibility, as you know, uh, what would you recommend to this committee we look at? Uh, well, at this, at this time, I don't want to give you anything specific. I'd rather get back to you either That's great. later on today or I can speak personally one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but off the top of mind, I don't have anything specific. But if you'd like, again, I can get something to you in writing or we can speak one-on-one. -on -one. Any questions? Sweet. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Randy Moore. Page 65, the members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, 
thank you for allowing us to come up. Um, of course, uh, we were hit, hit pretty hard in the uh, the 11 budget, so uh, hopefully, hopefully we won't. Pretty significant numbers for us. Uh, I hope uh, the governor's recommendation is $175,805 for fiscal year 12. We we think we can manage that um, um, as we are right now, the position that we are in right now. So, uh, just like to ask the committee, hopefully, consider not going any deeper with us. What's your, what's your reserves just like? I know we, we got some of that last time. Yes, sir. Um, I'm concerned about rainy day. Right. We Talk need to be that. capitalized, I think, uh, Ron, around half a million dollars uh, as we go into the fair. Uh, I think that that's about where we will be, Mr. Chairman, uh, at this point. And uh, I'm going from memory, so help me a little bit. Give me some wiggle room. But you, you anticipate if you lose a day to rain, that's normally about 350, and, and really rain usually doesn't come in and come out in one day, so you almost would prefer to almost be at 700 and get it out in two. Is that correct? Is that's that my, my yes, that right? That's absolutely right, Ron. Correct. And, and, and you're at 500,000 now. That's correct. Isn't it 500? Yeah. I'm sorry, who? Please, Come on up here. This is Ron Goldsby. He's our Chief Administrative Officer and Comptroller. The way it appears right now, Mr. Chairman, is at the end of this fiscal year, we should be approximating right at $1 million in reserves. Um, the information that I've passed up to the LBO and also the Senate Budget Office is that the value of a uh, fair weekend to us, a Saturday and Sunday combination. Uh, this past fair that we had, the first weekend was a value to us of net money of $950,000. The second weekend, Saturday and Sunday, was about $1.1 million of revenue that we realized from our gate emissions, uh, midway, and our food sales. And if we experience a rain out on the first weekend, then we may have the opportunity to make that up during the week and the last week. But if you have a rain out on the first weekend and a rain out on the second weekend, then we're just dead in water. Uh, that could be a loss to us of over $2 million in revenue, and that will definitely hurt the program. So what we're trying to build is our reserves of $1.2 million. We feel comfortable in that protecting us, providing the insurance of rain out. At the same time, it gives us uh, ability to meet our expenses month to month because our income stream varies uh, pretty significantly on a month to month basis. We need the capital to, to even out our income stream, plus give us a insurance policy for that rain. How's your, um, your your buildings looking? Is there anything that you've done on the drawing board there that we need to know about, the roof or anything? We do. Uh, actually, uh, the clock tower itself, which is the icon of the fairgrounds, is, is uh, in significant need of uh, recoding right now. We uh, estimate that's around a $50,000 project. Also, on top of that, we typically, uh, any paving initiatives or those types of things, we will typically, if, if we have the money, we will uh, we will pay for those out of our operating monies and, uh, instead of asking for our capital money. Mr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate you all being here today. Uh, I've gotten a couple of emails since the governor's budget has been published about the, uh, the million-dollar bond. Uh, for the horse barn. Can you kind of explain to the committee exactly sure. um, where this money is going to go and, and why it's needed at this time? Right. Uh, of course, you're all aware that we were given money uh, in the second phase of the livestock equine expansion to uh, build and construct a new 480 stall horse barn. Well, this is the original horse barn that's been there for 22 years now, and there's not a building on the grounds that's used anymore with any more frequency than the existing horse barn. Uh, it is uh, in critical need of repair. Uh, we intend to take the stalls out, uh, have concrete poured as a dirt floor, have concrete poured throughout, and, uh, and of course, recoat that building as well. But the barn, you rent the way our 
our model business model is set up with regard to the equestrian business, your, uh, your rental rates for the arenas cover the expense of, of the operation of the arenas, where we gain revenue and, and uh, a great revenue stream for us where we make our money, so to speak, is in the rental of those stalls. <coughs> so, uh, you know, for us to have, you know, a, a com continue the competitive, competitive advantage that we have in, in the state of Georgia with regard to competing for these national equestrian events, uh, it's imperative that we uh, get that barn brought up to scale as well. One follow Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Given given the fact how given the fact it's a million dollar project, how long do you anticipate that taking? Uh, and obviously, if the funds would not be available to you until if this was approved by legislature, July first, two thousand and eleven, right. is the project going to be done before the fair comes to town in October? Uh, no, or is it, it something that would have to wait till after the fair? And that's not the fair is not you know the critical need for the barn for the horse barn to be honest with you. It's it's the equestrian program and those. Typically, we'll have anywhere from a small horse show is about 400 stalls. Uh, and the rationale and the theory behind what we were trying to do in the expansion was to be able to accommodate three of those smaller shows or two medium-sized horse shows or one super show, which is usually around 2,000 horses at one time. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if we can continue on this track and gain and get this building up, uh, it won't impact us at the fair at all. Yes, sir. The note actually says um, to retrofit the horse barn. Correct. And cover existing practice ring. Are, are those two separate? They're they're right and adjacent to each other. We have the covered warm up rings that y'all had previously given us money for. We those are accomplished, and uh, what this this one ring of, of course is right uh, to the south excuse me, to the east of the horse barn, existing horse barn. So um, we're just hoping to cover that one and, and through the through that cost. Uh, uh, we hopefully will have a little money out of GA 16 that we can put with that in case, you know, because I think that 1.1 is a pretty tight budget for that initiative actually, but uh, we should have some remain, a couple hundred thousand, uh, hopefully at the end of GA 16 that we can uh, ask for redirection for this purpose as well. Randy, I'm sure you realize that there's others that look at bond packages and want to try to soak their project in with the House right. or Senate. I guess one of the things I'm asking is since those are two separate ones, have you done cost estimates on, on each one of those? Yes. Can uh, and you get we, those to us? Yes, sir. So in absolutely. case someone starts doing no. it, we, we know exactly yes. what we can do and maybe prioritize them for the benefit of this committee? No question. We'll certainly do that. Any other questions from the committee? Thank you all. all right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. back to page 48 for members of the committee and um, Gordon Joyner Georgia Commission on Equal Opportunity good afternoon distinguished members of the committee oh you're good <laughs> maybe I should just stop right here we are pressed to the wall just like everyone else. We are certainly, as we have each year, been willing to accept every necessary reduction in our agency's budget and to make it work. I will say to you that the Georgia Commission on Equal Opportunity, which the legislature established in 1978 and then significantly amended in 1988, is the only agency in the state of Georgia that does the work that we do. And the fact that you have an agency in the state government of Georgia to do this work makes the state eligible for millions and millions and millions of federal dollars that go to other agencies in the state, particularly the State Department of Community Affairs, which is the recipient from HUD of many millions of dollars in community, community development block grant funds which are passed on to local communities in the state. Now to accommodate 
the necessary budget cuts over the years. This is what this agency has done. This agency has no cars and has never had any cars. This agency has never taken a ride on any state aircraft. This agency has no cell phones, no Blackberries, no reserves, no consultants, no lobbyists, no contractors, no part-time employees, no receptionists, no secretaries, no deputy agency director. And I could go on and on and on down the list. We certainly accept the governor's recommendation for our budget for fiscal year 2012. We are closely assessed and evaluated on an annual basis by the federal agencies, which as you will see, provide almost half of our operating budget. We go through a close and thorough performance assessment. I will submit to you that one of the areas that the federal agencies look at very closely is the commitment of the state itself to support the activities of the agency and whether or not there are sufficient staff people to actually carry out the enforcement of our own state laws which have been assigned to this agency. Therefore, I'll conclude by saying, and then we'll be happy to take any questions, I'll conclude by saying that in a small agency such as ours, every single staff reduction has a major impact and effect, not only on our ability to enforce the statutes which this legislature gave to us to enforce, but also to meet our mandates and our performance assessments and evaluations by the federal agencies who contribute almost half of the less than $1 million total operating budget of the agency. Well, I wanted to conclude by bringing you greetings from uh, representatives area close by my hometown of Fort Valley Peach County Georgia thank you so much I, I just I, I heard that argument yesterday from someone else in, in regards to the effect it has with the federal and I'm gonna ask the same question I gotta assume that all states are in this boat I'll, I also have to assume that since we have the the AAA bond rating some states aren't doing as well as Georgia yes so, so I gotta I'm gonna gotta assume that with your work with the with the feds that they're sensitive to to what you're having to go through just like they would be with any state is there some reason that you feel like that that they're not as sensitive to us as they would be to anybody else or well, well or, or you're being treated more harshly than any other state uh, mr. chairman it's not that I think they would be any less sensitive to us your Georgia Commission on Equal Opportunity has sister agencies of the same type in South Carolina North Carolina Tennessee Kentucky Florida and throughout the United States all the way to Hawaii and New Hampshire it's not that the federal assessment is harsh it's just that as their own budget dollars dwindle they feel heat from above them to maximize performance with less dollars themselves and as recently and, I, and I'll just take the privilege of just quickly mentioning a couple of things uh, just this morning I was invited to lunch by the Southeastern Regional Director at HUD of the office to which the funds come to from us. We'll be going to lunch on Friday. And earlier this morning, I received an email from Washington, D.C. from the Assistant Secretary at HUD of our funding office uh, in response to an invitation that I sent to him to allow me to introduce him to that part of Georgia that's outside of I-285 Hopefully in April he will be able to come down and we're going to make a visit to Macon, to Warner Robins. We're going to go by the Lane Packing Company down there off of I-75. We may even go by the fairgrounds if we have some time. And then the Assistant Secretary has been invited, per my request, to address the Macon City Council and to meet with the Mayor of Macon. All of these are to continue to strengthen and build our relationship with HUD so that HUD will understand that as we are operating with necessarily reduced resources, we hope they will give us some leeway and give us some understanding. I just don't know, especially since the federal government may be shut down in a couple of weeks, I just don't know if they have the ability to show that leeway and that understanding. Thank you. Representative Allison. Uh, yes, sir. Um, 
I see that in your in the governor's budget proposal, it's eliminating one position in administration. That being said, how big is your department? How many employees are in your department? And what would be their breakdown from um, the point of how many administration do you have? How many, you know, you said you didn't have any secretaries. So I was trying to get an idea of how many people work in your office and what their job descriptions are, if you don't mind humoring me for a second. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Counting me? Yes, sir. There are 11 people, 11 warm bodies in our office. We have some vacant positions, and those have been kept vacant for purposes of budget management. Uh, OPB can testify that we have not taken any funds that have not been spent for personnel for authorized positions to spend on anything else. At the end of each fiscal year, we have returned the entirety of that personnel funding back to the state. We don't have any reserve funds at all. With the proposed cut for the current fiscal year, where we would lose a staff person, and as you said, for next fiscal year, where we would lose another staff person, uh, which I am hoping will be able to be taken from some other area of the office than administration, because there are only two people in administration, and I'm one of them in our agency. And the other one is our multitasking IT person who is also filling in for the uh, vacant administrative coordinator position in our office. So we feel that we can, but even more so, we feel that we have to effectively and efficiently absorb the loss of these two staff people, staff positions, the remainder of this year and next year, and make it work. But uh, if I continue to go down my list of what we don't have, uh, also tell you that all of us do our own typing and photocopying in the office. It is a very lean operation. Nonetheless, your Georgia Commission on Equal Opportunity has been acknowledged and lauded nationally over the last several years. Representative James. Am I on? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Commissioner. Yes, sir. If I understood you correctly, you're satisfied with the governor's recommendation. Yes, we are satisfied to accept the governor's recommendation. But yet you go on to say, if we had what we could do, why, why aren't you lobbying for the additional need, the additional money that you need in order for, your, for you to be more efficient? Uh, Representative James, you have asked a mouthful of a question right there that goes back before my 10-year tenure in this position, even in the good times when the economy was flowing and exploding, uh, previous leadership in this agency never did do exactly what you have said, and that is to come before you and make the case of what the agency's true needs are. In the legislation that established this agency in 1978, you in your wisdom authorized the agency to establish local offices of the agency across the state to enable it to operate more effectively. There is no other office of this agency than the one here in Atlanta. And that's why we try to take it out across the state. I will be in Albany in April also, uh, meeting with the Chamber of Commerce there, meeting with the mayor's office, and speaking at Albany State University. And we do that all over the state, north, south, east, and west. If the economy were to have turned around prior to my speaking to you now, yes, I would have a loaded list, easy to justify, of the needs of this agency to even more effectively and efficiently carry out the statutes that you've assigned to us to enforce. But in these economic times, it just would not be wise or prudent for us to ask for more, and that's why I'm stating to you that we will do with what you give us. One more comment, Mr. Chairman. Knowing the needs of your agency, I implore you to better prepare yourself to try and get the things that you need, get the funds you need to do a better job in what you need to be doing. With Thank that you. encouragement, I certainly will be happy to ask for more. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Council of the Arts. Thank you. Page 48, members of the committee. 
48. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If it please the committee, uh, I'll be referring to page 48 and uh, line 26.6.3. Uh, we, we would ask the committee allow us to take a $49,555 cut to uh, our contracts. We primarily have two contractors that we would be reducing in this particular area. Uh, also, we're carrying forward, as you uh, graciously let us do, in the amended 11, the transfer of the state uh, excess property program to the Department of Public Safety. And uh, on the next page, 26.6.5, reducing operating expenses uh, by uh, $10,311. I'd be glad to any, answer any questions. reduce operating expense uh, to be honest with you we back into it we okay. get a number and when we figure out how to make it work and see if we can align some things differently I, I appreciate uh, your honesty any, yes. any questions from members of the committee thank you thank you office of consumer protection mr. Sowers how are you sir Great, thank you. Page 49, members of the committee. Good afternoon, I'm John Sowers. I'm the new administrator of the Office of Consumer Protection. Mr. Bill Cloud, my assistant administrator, is here with me. Um, <clears throat> I'll be short and sweet if I may. We have worked with the Office of Planning and Budget to come up to the numbers that you see before you. Uh, we're we're going to do the same thing that Mr. English and his agency are going to do. We will find a way to save the money that's being cut. Uh, the chief way to do that is to avoid hiring additional personnel and leave our employee complemented where it is now, uh, and that's what we're going to do. We intend to magnify our presence and our <coughs> the effect of what we do by making better use of the Internet, which is a substantially free medium, to contact more business and consumer groups and make them aware of the statutes that we have and of people's rights and obligations under them. I'll be pleased to answer any questions. Uh, any that I can answer, I'm pretty sure Mr. Cloud can. Representative Allison. <coughs> yes, sir, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked uh, the gentleman a few minutes ago. Um, currently in your department, how big is your staff? Mm -hmm. we, have, we have within OCP itself, organically, right. 55 authorized positions, myself included. We have 47 people at work today. Um, there are an additional 23 positions, I believe it is, in the um, customer service office, which is organized under our office, uh, although I do not administer that office. So that's how many people we have. Uh, if you want to break it down, I can do that. We have. I, I guess when I look here at 26.9.3, eliminate five, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, five vacant positions, I was trying to figure out. Um, what type of positions you were going to eliminate? Were those going to be administrative? Are those going to be folks that are that are investigating or working on the ground? No, these are administrative positions. Okay. Uh, our investigators are extremely busy. Right. We have a criminal team of four people that I don't know how they get done what they get done every day. Um, and they're working on some really large cases that unfortunately we can't talk very much about sure. because of their sensitive nature. Uh, we also have seven civil civil investigators and they are also quite busy so no we're not we're not going to get rid of any of those positions 
those people, those positions are, are pretty much all filled, and we intend to leave it that way. That, that was my my concern. That's why yes, I asked sir. the question. But thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Uh, I want to ask about those same positions. Are, are they already vacant? Yes, sir. How long have they been vacant? Well, they've been. <laughs> I've been here five weeks. They've certainly been vacant that whole time. I believe they've been vacant for all or most of the uh, preceding year. Are there other vacancies that are there other vacancies that you have that you would be able to offer up for additional cuts as well? Frankly, I don't know of any. Um, we've we've looked at our staffing. Right, so you, you've offered up the only vacancies that you have, to the best of your knowledge. That's correct. And and I can't help but notice. I'm a South Georgia boy. When you do five people into four hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars, that's what ninety thousand of a paycheck. Well, that would include that would include more than just the raw paycheck. Certainly, um, there are other things being eliminated. We intend to spend less money on support activity, for example, subscriptions, uh, telephone lines, all the stuff that we have to pay money for. <coughs> so those vacancies aren't just the cost of an employee? Mr. Clapp can tell you. That's what I, I, was I guess what I'm trying to, based on your answer, I, I, that, I that's heard, what I, I was trying to draw. I haven't heard that answer it. before that it also mm -hmm. includes other, other things yeah. within the office. I didn't. I usually yeah. took personnel. I mean, just personnel. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I understand, and, and you're looking at about a 7%, and we, we may have to go another percent or two, and, and that's why I asked the question about, we, we've seen several agencies that, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that it's just a mere coincidence that the, that the, coincidence that the, the vacancies they're giving up is the only ones they currently have, and I just want to make sure that, that, that I understand that's the case for you all as well. I understand, but I didn't know if there was other vacancies out there. That's get, I get, that's the meat of my question. How many? I'll let you get that back to me. Uh, why do we do Cause, that? Because you yeah. hold those open. That, that's what we've been talking about on this committee. Mm -hmm. You hold those open, and then when we ask for the cuts, you offer them then. And so I'd like I'd kind of like to know exactly how many you have. Thank you. We'll get back to you. Anything else, sir? Any other questions from members of the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Office of the Child Advocate. Good afternoon. I'm Tanya Boga with Director of the Office of the Child Advocate. We have reviewed the governor's recommendations as well, and we have made the necessary adjustments so that we can operate within our budget as well. I'll highlight again for you that um, by reducing the number of offices, we previously had two offices, one in Macon and one here in Atlanta. We consolidated those two offices, both of which were at the time housed in private space and we've now moved into state-owned space. And so with that line, we're in compliance with that and that's gonna cause us to be able to save that amount. Also, we looked at the federal grants that we have, and we have pulled from them for personnel expenses, um, contract workers specifically, and that's helped with the bottom line of the budget. So we are in compliance, and we'll be able to operate with the adjustments that we are needing to make. Are there any questions? Members of the committee, any questions? L let me ask you, um, it, it's come to my attention. Explain to me your, your role and expenses associated with the Fatality Review Board? Yes, sir. That office was cons um, consolidated with our office. So 
I am the director of both programs, but we're all consolidated into the Office of the Child Advocate. So we have a, if you want to call it a division, but I try and say we're all just one office. So we do have workers who are responsible for the child fatality review. Mm -hmm. Is that information collected by other sources as well? I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by collected. Okay, let's start at the beginning. What does the Fatality Review Board do? The, we have work, um, two staff members who they go around the state and help the local panel reviews make sure that they are putting in their data appropriately and getting in the system. Now that's what our employees do. We have a review board, excuse me, as well, but that's, they're just an advisory capacity. I, it, and again, I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around it, but I want to say that this was created for members of the, of the committee mid-early 90s, something like that, and, mm -hmm. and through a piece of legislation, and I want to say funded at, I, I don't know, million, million and a half dollars? Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? That I am not familiar with. I'm a new appointee of Governor Dale, so I was not um, privy to that time frame. Okay. But and I do know that around 2008 or 9, these two offices were consolidated, and they were consolidated at the time I became the director. Okay. Can you find that out for me? Yes, sir. Very so good. So you want me to find out initially when it was created what the budget was? Sure. Because I, I, I've been told that we now have other, other people collecting that kind of data, and it may be, in fact, a duplication of services. Of, and I'm not ready to pass judgment on whether it is or it isn't. I'm just trying to collect information in regards to that. Yes, sir. I will find that out as well. But I will say that I have attended the advisory board since I've been appointed. And I did not hear that that was the case. In fact, they were asking for seeing if I could get some additional resources to <laughs> better assist. But I will find that out for you, sir. Very good. Um, Madam Chair Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and I do have a question for you concerning at one point in time when we were trying to consolidate some of our different uh, commissions and offices that deal with um, advocacy for children, we learned that there are restrictions to shared information that mm -hmm. comes some from the federal government and from other areas. It's a, it's a privacy thing. And, and so we were told, for example, a health could not be health data and statistics could not be shared with another state agency because mm -hmm. of restrictions. When you're looking into that, can you explain that to us? Because one thing we don't want to do is to lose the ability to protect the child. But at the same time, in the mm -hmm. years that I've served on this uh, appropriations committee, I have heard restriction of information used a lot as okay. to why we can't consolidate. So I think our committee needs to know Yes, ma'am. The I will history of that as well. Thank okay. You. I will look into that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Office of the State Inspector General, Mr. Hicks. page uh, 49 for members of the committee. I'm sorry, I think I, uh, page 50, I believe. It is page 50. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, we have, in my office, we have, we have completely eliminated our equipment budget, completely eliminated our IT budget. We've cut contractual services by 56%. Our operating budget now stands at $16,000. We are warm bodies, and that's all we are. There's five positions, three investigators, my position, and I do investigation, administration, education. This is my deputy inspector, deputy inspector general, budget man. We handle education between ourselves. We do photocopies, and we do whatever we have to do to get the job done within our office. But that is what we are, we're warm bodies. We sat there this morning, and we've looked at a caseload that's backing up on us, and I told them we're going to get it done with what we have. But that, that's where we stand in our budget, and that's how we've come down to what the governor has recommended uh, that you have on page 50. Let me ask the obvious question. I think you're looking at a recommendation of 4%. Yes, sir. You know, we're looking at maybe twice that much, if not more. Um, 
and, and if we have to do that, it, tell me why you think that, that, that you were only asked for four percent, and if you were asked to do six, eight, or ten percent, what would you do? We, we would. It would get into eliminating a position. Um, we would probably have to look at it eliminating our one administrative position. Just to be honest with you, I'm not going to eliminate if I don't have to an investigative position. The problem that presents with us is that we. For the last three weeks, my deputy inspectors have been outside the office almost totally. And I've been outside the office 75% of the time. And that essentially leaves our office unmanned. We receive complaints in our office, and we have to have a mechanism by which that can be done. It's essential. Um, you have to have a warm body to receive these. You have to have a mechanism for them to be handled. A lot of the things that come into our office, people are willing to make one phone call. They're not willing to make a second phone call, and we got to be in a position to answer those calls. But that is where we would have to make that cut, and it would compromise our ability to respond. How many employees do you have? We've got five. We've got one open position. It's an investigator position. It came open in December, and I, I have told them that we are not we are putting ourselves into the process to get that filled. <laughs> but I'm not going to make a final decision until we've had this budget resolved. I've got to have that position, but I don't think it's fair to put someone in there and turn around and have to make a decision that affects them. But I need that position. Chairman Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate what your the contributions you made and, and your comment there. I appreciate that. We heard it yesterday that you need it, you want it, but you're not going to hire someone that you have to turn around and understand that. Help me just understand, friendly question, just understand from your perspective, how many in the last several years, let's just say, how many inspectors have there been there? There's been a total of three inspector generals okay. that have served in my position beginning in 2003. Uh, well, I'm, I'm referring more to the investigative work. How many people uh, do you have doing the work of, of research and processing the uh, the claims or cases however historically I, I think I recall at one point that this office was somewhere it was either 13 or 9 somewhere when it was initially okay. started and it has just come down and down since then right. to where we are now and so, so how many live cases do you currently have give me an just a real quick and I mean if you can do it very quickly we, we an idea of how many cases probably you probably have about seven cases right now and what's, how long does it take to solve a case, settle a case, well, typically? the one matter that we're working on, again, I can't get into a lot of the specifics. That's fine. The one matter we've got on, I've got my two deputies working on this full time on that one matter. And it's an inner agency. We're working with another agency on it. They have literally been coming in at 7, leaving, calling me at 8 o'clock at night, leaving somewhere else. Uh, with our staff, when we focus on one, it tends to be an all-in effort. And so the one that they've been working on now, I think they're into their fourth or fifth month on with this other agency. The things that we have in line, we have issues that we could get resolved in two days. If you had I, okay. I have ones that I'm looking at right now that are going to, I could spend a year on, quite frankly, at some of the issues. And then how many calls, you say, that, you know, they call one time and that's it. How many calls per week do you get? We, we probably get anywhere between five to ten calls per week. Now, part of what we do and where we serve another purpose is a lot of those calls need to be directed to other agencies where maybe it's an internal personnel issue. And so what we have found with the 1-800 number we've set up is we managed to funnel a lot of people to where they need to be in the system as we filter through this. One, one final question, the language, Jim. Do you, do you track at all in, in – I hate it when I hear that governments track because that creates positions. But do you do you track any way the number of legitimate inquiries that come in that you actually take on as a case, and then what's your success rate there? We had in 2010, and this does not include referrals where we sent it out. We had 129 inquiries come up. We opened up 16 cases. Five of those related specifically to stimulus funds. Um, and so those 16 cases, considering they were dealing with a staff of about three deputies to do the investigation, and you're talking anywhere from a month to four months to conduct an investigation. I'll give you an example, if you'll bear with me, about one investigation. It kind of gives you a flavor of what happened. We were asked late last year by 
by the Department of Juvenile Justice to look at a situation involving employee theft of gas, misuse of one of the state gas cards. And we were asked to come in and look at what had happened and basically make recommendations on how to fix that problem. And Bill Donaldson here, Bill is a forensic accountant, um, went in, worked with them on this particular facility and discovered that one of the situations was, was the PIN numbers that they were using for their gas cards were their employee ID numbers which were printed on the front of their badges. So essentially the employee who was stealing the gas was, as I understand, writing down, jotting down PIN numbers as they went along and going out and taking them. So that was obviously one of the recommendations you need to stop that. But what Bill discovered as well was that the processor of those cards had a fraud alert system that had it been activated would have alerted the agency that this is something you need to look at. We found out that most of the state agencies that were using these cards had not signed up for the fraud alert system. As a result of what we did, Bill working with DOAS made them aware of that situation. DOAS then went out to the agencies and said, you got to sign up, you need to sign up. And as a result of that, there was a mass signing up of this credit card or this gas card alert system. To me, that is a, a great investment for the state to have had that accomplished and see that result. And th that's part of what our mission is, is to find solutions that we can export. Not, it's not central to just that agency. We want to find solutions that will work statewide and make sure all the other agencies know about it and take advantage of those resources instead of just keeping a solution within one agency. Let's figure out what worked, take it out, and let's let everybody see it. And that's part of our mission here. Thank you for that explanation. Yes. I was actually going to suggest that you give to our committee a description of your mission statement because um, in 2003, I think it was, yes. we had a, a new governor and that was, your office was created by executive order. Yes, ma'am. And so at what point in time did it actually become statute? I think it, it has not become statute. We so are still by executive, executive order. order. It's an executive order by the governor. Yes, ma'am. All right. I think that history might help us. We, we'll be happy to get that for you. <clears throat> I may ask a, a loaded question, so just 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 forgive the sure. the question. When I hear the words uh, investigation, being a lawyer myself, not in being here in 2003, I don't know why we have a a, a state agency whose sole responsibility is in investigating uh, other government agencies. Isn't that something that could be readily done by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? I mean, they may not be set up to, to, to do that, but isn't that something that We're not that dealing strictly with criminal matters. Our mission is fraud, waste, abuse, or corruption. Now, they can bleed in and become criminal matters, but, but sometimes when you're dealing with waste and abuse in particular, it may not entail a criminal matter that brings the AG's office or the GBI into it. It may be a practice that has been there for decades that is just wasting state taxpayer dollars that someone brings to our attention and we're able to go in there and find a solution for it and identify what happened. And that, that's a substantial part. So we fall a little bit into the gap between where the AG office, the GBI sits in trying to find some of these solutions. We, we deal with personnel issues that come up that maybe aren't appropriate to be handled within the agency. 90%, I believe that is correctly, 90% of our cases that we opened last year came from agency heads referring and asking us to come in and look at these issues for them. So obviously they saw a need to have an independent assessment of what may be going on within their agency. And that is when we could step in, we can bring up Bill, I said, as a forensic accountant. Uh, Deb Wallace, who works with me as a deputy inspector, is a trained criminal investigator, NCIS, a retired naval officer. It, these are really good people who know what they're doing. Well, I guess one follow-up, Mr. Chairman, and I'll finish, I promise. Um, I guess I would have one, one follow-up to that. Given the fact that part of it seems like it's a little bit of best practices kind right. of work, part of it's investigation, where would you say that the, uh, the fine line is? Are you doing more investigations that leading you to criminal behavior? Are you all doing more of the, more of the we, we want to come in and be more efficient and, and show more government accountability? Where would, you, where would you find that line? I mean, are we talking 50-50, 60-40, somewhere? What? Just... I think they actually go hand in hand, and this is some of the discussion we've had with uh, some other agencies as well, is even once you identify perhaps an investigation, you've identified some sort of wrongful conduct, and whether we refer it to the GBI, whether we refer it to the AG's office or whatever, there is still the question as to how did that occur, 
was it a systemic failure within that agency? And part of what we looked at is even if we identified the problem and tried to get some sort of correction, we would then want to backtrack and figure out how it happened. And is there some correction that needs to be made to keep that from repeating itself again? And again, I, I go back to this idea of we don't want to get into this mentality of circling the wagons within an agency so that we solve a problem but we try to ignore and act like it won't happen again. We want to be there to make sure it doesn't happen again. So even if we get a referral to the GBI, which is a fairly common situation, we then want to backtrack and make sure that problem gets fixed. One of the things that we're doing right now, and an email just went out about a few minutes ago, is we've been asked by the AG's office to try to get with every other state agency that has something in-house, that does investigations in-house within that agency, bring them all together and let the AG and the GBI and us discuss when do we call you in. Because the GBI has this concern, obviously, about someone going down the road and compromising a potential criminal investigation. We are trying to help facilitate that and make sure that information gets out there so that everybody knows and everybody's on the same playbook. Right now, we're not all on the same playbook, and we need to be there, and that's part of what we are doing right now is trying to get everybody on the same page. <clears throat> Since you were created not too long ago, you've mentioned GBI contacted you and the Attorney General's contacted you. Before you were in existence, what did they do? Nothing. I mean, there was the thing, that if it was not criminal, GBI doesn't deal with it. Well, I guess I'm concerned with, well, certainly there had to be some things that were criminal, and what sure. did they do? Well, it depends if they got the report from the My agency. point is I get a little nervous. I would hate for other agencies to use you, and, and I know that's what you're there, oh, no, no, yeah. as a way to slough off. No, absolutely, and that's why we're trying to bring everybody together so we know when that call needs to be made. And to identify, especially, you're going through a routine investigation that may seem like it's just a matter of an employee conducting business on state time for another entity. When does that, at some point, trip over into a potential criminal matter? And if we can bring those resources together so that we all know what that situation is. And the other thing we've talked about, too, is not only that, but as we sit there as a group that does this, we need to be sharing information. You know, we're dealing in a new age of internet fraud and wire fraud and all this. And again, we need to be exporting solutions across agencies. And we're not doing that right now. And that's part of what our mission is to try to do. Is, and I, I completely agree. We want to make sure people are not stepping into criminal investigations when it should be in the hands of the AG or the GBI and identify those lines. And they well, have I'm enough. just saying by extension because we've seen this where we've got some agencies that are, that are getting others to bill for them and doing this for them and don't let them have it and, you know, kind of a little turf battle going right. on. And it's just part of me that wonders if you're an attorney general and you've got, I don't know, somebody, two people on payroll for $150,000, well, maybe I can shift that somewhere else because I'll just give those cases to you. Right. Well, I, I can't speak to the motivations of why. I'm mean, using that as a hypothetical. but Right. Um, I know that most of the situations that I have at least looked at, at the gas card situation was not really a referral to AG or GBI. That's not a situation because the criminal matter had been dealt with by the GBI. And so we were coming in more after the fact to do the best practices sort of situation and to assess how did this happen and how do we plug that hole going forward. Chairman Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when Secretary of State uh, uh, Handel was in office, she created uh, an Inspector General's office on the Secretary of State. Is that still in existence, or did it merge with the Governor of your office? I, I don't know if the Secretary of State's office. I, it, it has not merged with our office. Do they still have theirs in place? I believe they do. They still have their agency established themselves. They're very Probably concerning her commissions and boards and that sort of thing. And of course, we, we sit there and serve the ability of situations where they can't investigate themselves. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Department of Audits, Mr. Hinton, page eight. Uh, 
How you do? Good. Do y'all do, do? I'm just. Do y'all do forensic accounting? Uh, we have we have two uh, two to three people on staff, which that is a specialty of theirs. But their work is they don't do solely that. They they're just skilled in that particular. Thank you. Um, that area. Well, um, I th I think our cuts are on page eight. Um, I'll I'll try and go through the uh, and give you the uh, the total cuts and uh, what areas we're looking at. The uh, um, as we discussed before, our we're approximately eighty eight percent people, three percent computers. So so if we're looking for real money, we have to go for people. Um, the uh, um, so our our cut um, our our total cut at six percent is one point seven million dollars. Um, the one so our cut in personal services is one point five million. Um, this cut includes a reduction in staff of of positions for our what was formerly our fraud Medicaid fraud unit. There, through a governmental reorganization, those positions will be taken out of our budget. We won't be filling them again. Um, those positions will be transferred to the Department of Law. And, um, and then they will be funded through, primarily through federal grant. So that our, our appropriation will be reduced for that. Uh, those so those positions will come out of our our count. Um, the remainder, six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, we're gonna we're gonna make that up by holding open some positions in our performance audit division. This is going to impact us our ability to get audits out as requested by the House and Senate, but. Um, we we feel like that at some point, if if we are able to fill those positions, that'll allow us to get our work done in a in a more timely w manner because we're really up against the wall right now. Um, we're gonna we're gonna hold some positions open in our information technology risk and assessment group. Um, uh, of course, that's uh, that's a critical area as well. But we're we're gonna be able to hold some positions there. And also in our healthcare audit uh, group, they uh, we've last year we eliminated 28 positions from that division as a result of budget cuts, including uh, including 13 13 um, persons who we had to let go in June to uh, to to come into this year's budget uh, through by. Um, by the reduction in the number of our personnel, we were able to consolidate some space in the Trinity Washington building where we're housed, and uh, we will have a reduction of $27,500 in our rent by giving up some space, and that's offset, offset somewhat by our increase in our rental rates to GBA, but, but $28,000 there. Um, once we're going to continue to try and reduce our training budget, um, our through the various professional certifications that we have, and also by the fact that we do our work in accordance with governmental auditing standards established by the GAO, we're required to have 80 hours of continuing professional education every two years. Um, whereas before we had done that through a mix of internal and external uh, training sources. We're trying to keep all that in house and utilize the expertise of the people on our our staff uh, to meet those criteria. Uh, we're we're going to further reduce our our travel budget by ninety five thousand dollars. We uh, we've been we've been on a program the last several years of moving to electronic working papers. We're trying to do as many as many analytics as we can. 
um, over the internet or and 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 be ready when whenever we go on site so where we don't have to be there that makes everybody happy um, the uh, and we're based on some of these other reductions we're we're hoping to achieve a reduction in supplies and materials of about $25,000. And uh, that's, that's in summary, that those are our cuts as outlined on page six, and uh, I'll be glad to ask any questions. Chairman Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Commissioner, you said 88% of your budget is people. Yes, sir. With technology being where it is today, could some of these people be eliminated and technology put equipment in there to handle what you're doing? Well, I, w I, would, I would think that that would further hurt our audit effort. What, what, we, what our personnel do is analyze information that we obtain through the computer. And it's not something that a computer can, can automatically um, make an assessment of data or question data or something like that. So our role is, as auditors is to analyze the data that we get through that. But uh, as, far as, as far as elimination of positions, it, our, our role is somewhat different. One problem, Mr. Chairman. So are you saying then that you need more people? No, sir. I'm not. So you're satisfied with where you are? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did you, did you say how many how many people you do have on your staff? You may uh, have, and I may have missed it. Yes, sir. Um, right now, it is. Uh, at the start of fiscal year 2009, we had 358 authorized positions. Uh, we began fiscal year 2011 with 316 authorized positions. So that's, uh, that's a total of 42 positions that have been reduced from our workforce, or 11% reduction in that. And uh, Of the 316 that are authorized, how many are filled? 316 are authorized, and right now we have uh, – we lost two more last week to other agencies. Uh, we're at 285 uh, filled positions, and we have six time-limited positions. Uh, we were um, we worked with the budget offices, and we were able to bill for our the additional services that we perform under the uh, American Recovery Act. Um, that that imposed quite a lot of additional audit. The, the federal guidelines imposed a lot of additional audit effort. And so we were able to build the agencies that we were auditing doing that, uh, where we were doing that arrow work. Um, those, all those positions are time limited. And I mean, when we hired those positions, they knew that whenever we complete the arrow funding, arrow audits, which will probably be next year, um, then those positions go away. Quick question. I don't need an exact number, but of the 285, how many are actually accountants actually doing field work versus support personnel? Um, we have an, uh, let's see, we have a, an administrative section of uh, 12, 12 positions, and our IT support group is about 13 positions, I think, and pretty much everybody else is in the so audit. 25 support staff and the rest are accountants mm -hmm. actually doing field work. Okay. Yes. Okay. Any other questions from members of the committee? Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, it. sir. Department of Banking and Finance. Page 19 for members of the committee. Department of Revenue, you're the next contestant. Mr. 
Chairman, members of the committee, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, it's also a pleasure to be here without any television cameras. I wanted to uh, walk through the, uh, our 2012 budget, uh, talk about a couple changes we've instituted at the Department of Revenue and uh, requests we'll make uh, to you uh, to help facilitate those changes. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the money in the bonding package for our department and efficiencies we can think we can drive with that. And then if interested, I can talk a little bit about some other opportunities that I think we see uh, to drive efficiency through our department. On the 2012 budget, uh, I believe it starts on page 79 of 101. I'll just walk through the line items and highlight those, sig those of significance. Uh, most of the changes you see are retirement system changes, telecommunication workers comp. I won't spend time on those. They run throughout our budget and everybody else's budget. Uh, the first of significance is 41-4 or 41.4.4, replacing state funds with other funds from the tobacco stamp program. Uh, this is in the nature of a fund source swap. We're able to generate cost of collection or fees at the department and return money uh, to the, the general fund in the amount of just over a million dollars, and we believe that's an attainable number in next fiscal year. Just below that is 41.4.5, uh, uh, again, replacing state funds with funds from the licensing of coin-operated uh, coin amusement machines. Again, we think that number is achievable. Uh, however, there is a piece of legislation, I believe, uh, that is out there that could have an impact on that number, uh, depending on what happens to it. I don't have the House Bill number, but now I do. Uh, bill, House Bill 164. That was generated last year through part of the fees? No? Right. Was that, was that part of that? Okay. And that number has increased in the next fiscal year, but we, we think given everything remaining the same, that number is, is reasonable. Again, subject to any legislative changes uh, that y'all may choose to make this year. Uh, going down uh, to uh, 41.6, local tax official retirement in FICA. Uh, I just note 41.6.1. Uh, this line item is, is really a pass-through for the Department of Revenue. Uh, it, the numbers are generated by the employee retirement system. And these are retirement funds that are sent to local jurisdictions to pay retirement for local tax assessors. We are merely a pass-through vehicle for this. We don't generate the number. We don't really have any control over these people. I, I know it's been a source of some discussion in the past, but I just highlight it for you. And this number has jumped around considerably. I think it's in the millions of dollars. In this fiscal year, it's 600000 Next Next fiscal year, I can't give you any great detail of why that is, but I highlight it for you. You're exactly correct. That is what the issue is. Uh, flipping the page, page 80. Uh, motor vehicle registration and titling, 41.7.4 uh, shows the elimination of uh, just over or just under $700,000 of funds. This is a program where we put printers in county offices. It has now run its course, and we do not need money to continue that program. Um, under the Office of Special Investigations, 41.8. Uh, at 41.8.4, uh, re we're reducing funds that had been appropriated in fiscal year 2011 for the purchase of equipment related to uh, some additional um, uh, staff. Uh, again, we now have the equipment. We don't need the funds. Uh, obviously, at some future point, we'll be back in front of you when, those, uh, when that equipment has worn out. Uh, but for the next fiscal year, we do not need the money. Uh, the next two, uh, there are two significant items in this budget. Uh, that uh, I need to note, and one of them is under revenue processing. 
Um, first, uh, under 41.9, at 41.9.4, uh, there is a reduction uh, due to operational efficiencies from the increase in e-filing in the amount of 165,000. That's a, that's a fine number. We think we can achieve that. Um, what is not in here is uh, the uh, total cost of keeping temporary workers available to process tax refunds in the spring. And this is something that comes back before you all on a fairly regular basis in the amended budgets. Um, it would be our request in a perfect world uh, that we fully fund that program at the beginning of the fiscal year uh, so that we have certainty as to how much money we have to spend on temporary workers. And uh, just to uh, make certain uh, we're all on the same page, this is in the spring when we have the influx of individual returns. Uh, we staff up to hire folks to process those returns. In the absence of that temporary staffing, uh, the returns pile up. They go past uh, July 15 when interest starts accruing. Uh, and in the past, it has happened, I believe, in one occasion a couple years ago, the general feeling, uh, certainly to the Department of Revenue, is that's not a great result, but obviously we need the funds to do that. In this budget, there's about a million two, I believe, of money to uh, hire temporary workers. The total cost on a yearly basis is about 2.7, so we're lacking about a million five. Um, that's something that is in, in discussions in this year's amended budget. Uh, again, our, our, in our perfect world, we'd have certainty about the amounts that we have available. We can structure our operations a little more efficiently if we know. Uh, we're not opposed to coming back to you in an amended, amended budget and asking you, but just from efficiency perspective, I think in our perfect world, we'd have it all in one place. It's a, in the, so the, uh, that's the total amount there is $1.5 million. Uh, under Section 41.10, Tax Compliance, um, this is the other significant uh, number in our budget. Um, is 41.10.4, uh, replacing $2 million of funds, of state funds with, from a garnishment program. Uh, we have in place a program of uh, employees at the Department of Revenue that are targeted uh, folks who have a known amount due to the state, and we work on either garnishing the wages or collecting. Um, that program has been very effective. Um, in fact, it's so effective that it, it has impacted how this revenue comes in. The $2 million anticipates that we go through a process where we make phone calls, send letters, ultimately garnish people wages. And in that garnishment, there's a fee or a cost of collection that stays with the Department of Revenue. In fact, what is happening is as these people are contacted before garnishment happens, they start paying their bills. So the net effect to the state has been a very positive one. I think we've ex exceeded uh, expectations. The net effect to the Department of Revenue as far as fees or cost of collection staying with the department has been under what has been projected because people are paying sooner, they're not going through the garnishment process, and they're paying the amounts that are owed. So this number that was given to OPB uh, several months ago was a good, num good estimate then. I think our experience has suggested that it is overstated as far as uh, cost of collection revenue to the department in that $2 million amount. Uh, again, in our perfect world, um, we would you know, eliminate that reduction uh, to take account for how things are actually happening. Next is um, 41 or 41.10.5, um, an increase of 8.7 million. Really, this is not an increase; it's a move of uh, from 41.11.1, which was the new program that y'all funded last year. We're just moving into a permanent program and actually taking a slight reduction in that amount. Uh, the last two items under 41.10 are 41.10.6 and 41.10.7. Uh, these are costs of collection fees. Uh, one in the amount of 800,000, one just over 500,000, and we both think those numbers are achievable next year. So that 1.3 million uh, is something we certainly think we can live with. Uh, one small change uh, in 41.12, we would prefer to change the titling of this uh, program from tax law and policy to tax policy. Uh, it recognizes the fact that we don't really have in-house lawyers at the Department of Revenue. We have folks who obviously track legislation, understand how that legislation needs to be applied. Uh, we look to the uh, Attorney General for legal advice, and I think there's been some question in the past about exactly what this group does, and uh, just to try to clarify things, we would suggest taking those two words out. Though we would certainly trade the two million for the two words if that were an option. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, under Technology Support Services 4113, uh, 
13.4, we believe in next fiscal year we can achieve some efficiencies in our IT department in the tune of $555,000 uh, that will come through uh, headcount reduction uh, at, at the appropriate time. But we think uh, that is a reasonable number, in fact, when we, um, when we suggest it, suggested. Uh, so to recap, I think there's two significant changes uh, from this budget. One is the $1.5 million in temporary workers to fund the process, and the other is that $2 million uh, on the garnishment side. Uh, let me speak. Uh, well, one, any questions on that? And then I was going to uh, talk a minute about the bond. Yeah, uh, that's, before we get into bond, let's cover some other stuff first. Chairman Peak. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner, um, uh, I want to commend you. Uh, you've come in and tackled some pretty tough stuff in your first couple of weeks on the job, and it uh, seems like you've handled it in a pretty good manner. So, so congratulations and uh, keep up good work. Let me, I do want to address one thing with you that has affected. I'm not quite sure where it's in here. Um, and you and I may have had this conversation, but I can't remember. But um, I had several constituents, including myself, um, who, who had to deal with several issues related to liquor license. Um, that you know, we, we, we renew the state liquor license on an annual basis. Usually, the process is you go th get it through the city or county, apply to the state, um, but but uh, restaurants and other places cannot uh, buy their their liquor until they have that license posted actually on the wall. That's that's the way the vendors treat it. And we there were some significant issues with not getting those licenses out on a timely basis to the point of where restaurants were not able to serve it serve uh, drinks in their restaurants. Is that something you have been able to get your arms around and handle from a, is it a budgetary issue, is it have staff, or, or, I mean, because this is affecting a lot of businesses in our state. Uh, it was a significant issue at the end of last year, and the steps we have taken so far, I don't, at least in the immediate uh, term, I don't believe it's a budgeting issue. I, I think we can handle it another way, and we've already taken steps to do that. Uh, what I've done is, um, realigned all of the licensing function in one area of our department under the regulated industries under um, Howard Tyler who's our director and asked him uh, to move some folks around from customer service to take care of that uh, the other thing that he would like to do and I'm fully supportive of this and I, I believe we have the support of most of the folks in the industry as well is to move to though this will take a little bit more time more of a rolling calendar on those renewals just like you'd see with driver's license or any other number of licenses so it, they're not all back end loaded at the end of, of calendar year. Um, that actually has two benefits for the department and the public. Uh, one is you don't have the seasonality to the renewal process. The other is uh, the department has used uh, tax payments as a, an effective choke point on those licenses. If you don't pay your taxes, you don't get your license, and that makes sure people pay their taxes. Uh, but because it's back end loaded at the end of the calendar year, all those tax checks are done November-ish kind of time frame. What we'd like to do is, if we move to this rolling calendar, uh, we'll try to, well, not try, but part of that would be to keep an update on people's payment of taxes on a monthly basis. So not only will we have staggered people to the year, we'll also know if people are paying their taxes on a regular basis. And if they don't, they get their license pulled in the middle of the year. We don't have to wait to the end of the year to do that. It, it takes two steps to do it. One is to move some people, which we can do right away. The other is uh, on the technology side. Uh, and it actually does feed into the bond packages, rolling in our alcohol and tobacco into our integrated tax system. There's money in the bond package for that for next year. So that part will take a little bit longer, but I think the, this immediate step of realigning some folks um, and uh, making sure we have a clear line of uh, responsibility on that should help. Um, in fact, it will help. Okay. It sounds like you own it. If I can help you with that, I'm going to talk offline. That'd be great. And. Uh, just in that area. Yeah, and, and, and we're, uh, I think one of the things I've tried to make clear is uh, we're very open to any good ideas that folks have uh, to try to improve our customer service. It's one of the things we obviously need to concentrate on. And actually one thing that I'd like to touch on before we leave the budget, if, if you can remind me to do that. Thank you. I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the tax compliance. Um, you're moving the special project auditors to the tax compliance program. And it, it seems like that we did that for the purpose of you know, we being the General Assembly so that we could trace the dollars and see if we're actually recuperating the funds in that. Yep. Are we are we undoing what we did with, with what you're suggesting? Uh, 
Well, I don't. I can't tell you um, exactly why this is lumped together from a budgeting perspective. This was done, you know, as I came on board. From a tracking perspective, my plan is to keep tracking these folks separately. In fact, my plan is to measure everything that we do at the department, so we can tell you exactly how much every auditor, every average auditor, collects on a yearly basis, how much they cost. This group, I think, we can keep separate and track separately. It would certainly be my intent to do that. Well, now, why is it necessary to do it? Just from a budgeting perspective, I defer to our budget experts. I'm sorry. You convinced the governor's office. <laughs> I'm sorry. How would you do that? We have systems uh, associated with federal and uh, we all get that on a monthly basis or quarterly. How would we get that? What's the plan there? Sarah would get it. All right. Um, let me ask you about your um, your titling program on the motor vehicles. Yes. Um, you got companies that are purchasing some of that tag data information. Are you absolutely convinced that that the state is getting as much dollars from that and, and get, as um, we possibly could? I know that there has been a discussion in the past. I, I believe the companies that are purchasing the data believe we are charging too much. In fact, um, I know that they think they're we're charging too much. They've uh, directly. You're absolutely convinced much. we're not leaving any money on the table. Uh, no, I couldn't say that. Um, I think that has been a negotiated number. Uh, there's been uh, pressure on both sides of that argument. Uh, I think the number that we're at now it seems to be one that we're comfortable with, but I couldn't tell you that there couldn't be movement one way or the other, and it'd be still in some range of uh, are you planning on Are y'all planning on meeting prior to the budget to see? The, the, I just think if there's money that's left on the table out there for Georgia and the Department of Revenue, we would want to know about it. In fact, uh, I think the rate that we're charging now is one that we're very comfortable with. The folks who buy it, uh, I think, will push hard to either legislatively or some other way lower that number. That's not something that I think we would support uh, on its face. Have you had enough time to check on, on the competitiveness of the rate that we charge in Georgia versus uh, other states? I've, I've seen some data on the southeast. I think we uh, we are high compared to other in the southeast. Um, that's part of that, I think that's their argument. That is. Uh, part of that is due in this does feed into one opportunity, we think, on the capital investment side. We run a system that is from the 1990s. I'm not a computer programmer, but I'm told it's in Cobalt, uh, which is a archaic system. Uh, it is a difficult system to administer to run. It costs a lot of money to do it. In, in fact, one data point for you, every time a local jurisdiction runs a tag in the state, it hits our mainframe, and we are charged for that. Um, if we could move to a server-based environment, we could eliminate I think literally millions of dollars in cost per year. Uh, now, to build that system requires 15 to 20 million or 18 to 20 million dollars. Uh, but we think that's a great place if the state is thinking about, if y'all are thinking about places to invest to drive efficiency in our department, that would be at the top of the, our list. The 18 to 20 million, you said? 18 to 20 and million. And how much were you asking for in the bond package for the scanners? Uh, 800,000. Okay. And then there's, I think the, in the bond, there's 800,000 for scanners and $3 million to roll uh, the last or the most of the last of the our systems into the integrated tax system, including that alcohol and tobacco that we just spoke about. So the total bond package, uh, our part of the bond package today is about $3.8 million. Chairwoman Smith, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. You're a good student. you up on lots of things we've been asking you. I'm going to go to the area of temporary workers and phone calls I tend to get about the time someone uses the paper return to, to file their tax returns. And a couple of months later, I get a call saying my, ch I have, my check's not been deposited yet. So I know that's a problem. And I was just going to ask, um, you, you haven't gotten there yet, but is there a system in place? Um, I can get a phone call three months after they, they've turned in their return and their check. And 
still not been deposited. So. Yeah, and that's obviously something. There's a couple areas on the customer service side that we need to address. That is clearly one of them. Uh, I spoke a little bit earlier about funding for the temporary workers. That helps, as will the uh, capital investment in scanners that allows us to process things much more quickly. Though the reality is we have, what, 4 million returns that come in, most of them in a very short time period, and, and it does just take some time to push them through. <laughs> Uh, the other place uh, that we have heard, I have heard loud and clear, is on our customer services uh, phone calls into the department. Uh, starting now, the average wait time will be significant, um, north of 45 minutes. Um, one thing that I would like to do, and I think I need your assistance in doing this, is transferring some of our administrative dollars that we spend at the Department of Revenue to our, well, to our what we call um, uh, customer service or uh, taxpayer services division. Uh, it's in the nature of $300,000, uh, that, that those personnel that I'd like to move out of admin and move down closer to the, to the taxpayers, uh, I think we can get, uh, I, I know we can get uh, better results. They still won't be where everybody wants them to be, but I think as I look at our resources and how we spend them, that's a place where we can do better than we're doing right now. Thank you. One more question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, also, for your legislators, since we're getting these phone calls, if there's a contact person we can call to, to pass that information on. That would help we, us name and number. Absolutely. That. And we do have someone who, who, who can assist with that, and we can, we'll make sure you get that information. Thank you. And, and then um, before, I've had explained to me that when you use the word temporary workers, it usually is a pool of workers that have been trained, and you bring them in each year. That it, you're not retraining every year. Can you explain a little bit the process um, for temporary workers? It's, uh, I believe that is the case. I don't have all the details. I, uh, Mr. Peacock may have a little bit more, but yes, I believe that's the case that many of these workers are year over year seasonal kind of folks who come and work for us. Uh, so what you've said is, I think, mostly accurate. I don't know if you want to add any color to that or not, but, um, I, I, but the short answer to your question is yes, that's what we try to do. Thank you. I, I, again, just Mr. Chairman, um, I'm glad to see that you're trying to emphasize customer service as these calls come in. Thank you. Bob Package. Okay. Uh, I think as we've already. Page, page 100. Sorry. I think we've already just now briefly mentioned what's in here now. There's two items. Um, one is $3 million to, to move. Um, some additional uh, tax systems to our integrated tax platform. Uh, we have now, with this year, with y'all's uh, significant investment of state funds, uh, have moved the vast majority of our, of our tax systems over to an integrated tax platform. Uh, the last big, uh, or the biggest chunk is happening this year on the individual returns uh, with, a, with a final implementation date of November of this year. Uh, there are still some pieces, the alcohol and tobacco, uh, and some other ancillary taxes that we'd like to move to that system as well. The cost of that is about $3 million. Uh, that is down significantly from, say, this year's, where I think the cost was about $9 million, 13, well, not even close, 13 and a half. Um, had the wrong number in my mind. Uh, and this should get us the vast, vast majority of the way there on the integrated tax platform. Absolutely. But when I read of 800000 to purchase scanning machines, how many of those do you already have? Three. Three. And, and these are not, um, you know, piece of paper, you know, scanners like you and I think about. These are, you know, big, uh, big pieces of equipment that move a lot of paper. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to give you a little color. I guess what I'm asking is, is that you know, if we end up in that's not an 800,000, that's a 600,000. I always get a little, just a little nervous when I see scanning machines, high-speed scanners, shredders, 
So, you know, if you can kind of let us know where your priority really is and what we combination. Can, we, can, we can get you a breakdown of the, a detailed list of equipment, I would assume. You're right. I'm assuming you all got a cost list and how you came up to that 800000 and somehow it had to be paired back to six hundred. We don't want to give you shredders, shredders when you wanted scanners. I, 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 I certainly understand that. I, I don't. I don't want to come back next year and be asking for scanners and someone go, well, didn't we already fund you that? You know, so let's just keep it up on the up and up and give me that list. Happy to do so. Any other questions from members of the committee? Thank you all. And is banking here? Thank y'all very much for again. My name is Rob Braswell, Commissioner of Banking and Finance. With me is Tracy Whitesides, our Deputy Commissioner for Administration. Hey. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. And I want to thank you for allowing us to come uh, later. Uh, our housekeeping bill was being addressed on the, on the House Banking Committee, so I appreciate that. Uh, real quickly, because I know you've seen this, but I always like to uh, remind the committee members, if it's at all possible, we'll go through the handout. If you don't mind. And page one there just shows the. Uh, the amount of revenue from the different institutions that we regulate, as well as the appropriations that uh, we've received over the last several years at the bottom. Uh, average net revenue that we bring to the state is about $10 million. Then on page two, you just see the breakdown of the institutions that we regulate and the numbers that we do. And you see the bottom right there where the number has jumped up and because we started licensing mortgage loan originators this past year and have about 4,300 of those. Page three, real quickly, it just shows the growth in the number of uh, assets that are under our supervision. And you see there's about 273 billion uh, assets under our supervision, which is second most in the nation after the uh, state of California. Page four, you see the uh, institutions are kind of a graphic illustration, I guess, of the environment in which we're working in. Those are the number of state chartered institutions that have uh, failed and been uh, taken in receivership since 2008. There at the bottom right hand corner you see the uh, history of the department staffing. 1994 was our high water mark. We had 135 employees. Today we have, actually it's 95 as of today. Uh, number of bank examiners, uh, 95 back then. We had 58 as of today. And then on page five, we're getting to the governor's office uh, proposed reductions in our Department. And you see there with the asterisk, asterisk beside most of those, those are items that we have already uh, completed. Uh, we have already uh, changed a training manager. Uh, we have switched her back to being in the field as a senior financial examiner. There was a vacancy there, and so we no longer have a training manager. Uh, we've had a reduction force of two bank examiners. One of those was a credit specialist that uh, examined helped examine the credits at our largest institutions, such as SunTrust and Synovus. Another was just a, a, a community bank financial examiner. Uh, we are in the process, well, we virtually have closed the College Park office, I believe, this week or uh, next week. The movers are actually physically coming and we'll move the last uh, vestiges of the department out of that office. Uh, there's a, some empty uh, desk in uh, Credenza's. Uh, the Savannah office, uh, will be uh, starting next in March. We'll start the process of closing that office. And of course, you know, the lease runs till June 30th. And uh, by June 30th, we will be completely uh, vac have vacated that office. Uh, the elimination of a, mor of a money service business examiner by redirecting them to a mortgage examiner. There was a vacancy uh, in the mortgage examination uh, level. Uh, that's where our priority is compared to the money service businesses. So we have moved uh, that gentleman over to the mortgage uh, side and left the money service business uh, position vacated. Uh, we have uh, had a 
reduction in force of a supervisory mortgage examiner, trying to eliminate middle management uh, where we can. Uh, that's what we did there. A mortgage examiner position unfilled. We've had several departures there throughout the uh, last year. That position remains unfilled. And then lastly, uh, a reduction in travel costs for examiners. We have tried to, as always, carpool, utilize day cars, ride together, uh, telework days, do as much off-site as possible, all those things, and uh, th there are times when we have had to delay going on to do an examination of some sort due to travel costs involved to ensure that the funds are there, and so that would be a, a small reduction there. Are there any, any questions? Members of the committee. We got a three percent reduction. That's what we're scheduled for. Um, if we, well, that's the recommendation. If we have to get more, where do you recommend we going? Uh, items that we have uh, that we have put on our list is you know kind of prioritized everything. Uh, we have a reduction in temporary help for applications and renewals currently because of we the amount of our administrative staff has been reduced. Do you have a copy of those? I don't have to have it today. But okay. Where, where yes, if we, we can, have yes, to, yes. Can you yes. get those to us? Yes, we sure can. Chairwoman Smith. Thank you, Chairwoman. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. And I'm looking at your handout on mm -hmm. page two, and um, I understand the jump in the mortgage brokers and lenders and loan originators because of the law passed in 2010. That's right. And I'm curious about the number for uh, check cashers. It jumped pretty good. Well, it really is almost uh, 2008 to 9 was kind of an anomaly. That's the only year that it really didn't jump. It's kind okay. of been a steady growth. Uh, if you kind of look back for several years, it's just been a, an area of, of steady growth. Um, that industry has just, uh, we continue to have steady applications coming. I don't know that there's been a change in any law or anything that would, would uh, that have promoted that, but it's just been steady growth in that area. To understand the nature of check cash it's not a traditional bank so it's a it's a it's business if you can explain because I, I think these people don't have ac access to traditional banking is where I'm at that's you right usually that. that's right either they're uh, not bank they're called the unbanked or the underbanked one or the other but traditionally uh, they don't have uh, perhaps a checking account at a bank and so uh, they get their paycheck and go to uh, a strip mall and you'll see where it says checks cash and they go for a small fee, they'll have their checks cash and walk around with, with a small fee part. <laughs> <laughs> and how's it regulated? That's exactly where I'm going. Go ahead and answer those. How's it regulated? What is that small fee? Well, we get war stories, and we never know what's true and what's not. So Right. It's capped um, for, for a check casher that's in the business that advertises and the, and the things. I believe it's 2% for a government check, 2% of the amount of the check that they cash for a government check, for a non-government check, and there's a minimum, I think, of $2 or 2%, whichever is the, is the uh, lower. Yes, yes, and then, um, and then for non-government checks, I believe the cap is 5%. But we, our department regulates that. Now, we did have three examiners doing that through budget cuts, we now have one half, well, I would say one quarter of an examiner doing that. Uh, a person spends a fourth of her time going out to examine check cashers. The other three quarters of the time she's doing administrative work licensing those check cashers. Someone at the local, I'm just going in my mind, and we're doing what I'm doing, someone doing at the barbershop slash tanning bed Slash check catcher. <laughs> Lawn more, more tax return. Uh, that's that's ice cream and small engine repair. <laughs> if 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 the third part of that window read and cash checking, mm -hmm. you know, you know about them because they go and get a business license that says that. 
How would you How would you know if if someone's operating without a license? Uh, well, whatever. How would you right. know? Right. How do, how do they make your list? Usually, we find out those that are operating without a license, those that haven't gone through the process through competitors. They will. Uh, other competitors have we'll gone through the them. process sure. and they tell them. And, that, and that's what we found to be true in the mortgage side as well, mortgage lenders and mortgage brokers. If somebody's unlicensed. Now let's suppose they for the moment they are. I'm sorry? Let's suppose for the moment they're not licensed. Now what do you do? Okay. We go in and do it. We'll, uh, that individual on her quarter uh, percent of her time will go in and examine them. And uh, if we can find out they are operating without a license, we will issue a cease and desist order against them so to, to prevent them from doing that. That's published. And if they continue to operate, then we seek a court injunction against them. Let, let me ask the obvious question. Why don't, why don't we find them? Well, it's impossible to collect, basically, somebody you don't license. We have no leverage over them to find them. I mean, we could issue a fine if it was on the law, but we would have no way of so collecting them. legislation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Great, thank you very much.